of Mark. I mean, we took a break last uh, Sunday and for um, anniversary um, service and our celebration. Amen. But we'll be continuing um, this morning. Um, just recapping, amen, the last time we uh, ended with the story of the rich young ruler, amen, and Jesus, um, you know, told the disciples that it was easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle. And we explained what that was, that that wasn't a literal needle, so a needle, uh, but it was a specific gate, a small gate in the wall um, that, um, you know, was, was set up for security purposes. So during the night and so on, um, if somebody's coming with their animals, they would have to unload them to enter into the city. And we talked about how it's, you know, it's important if we were to follow Jesus that there are things that we're going to have to lay aside. <laughs> Amen. Um, and so right after that, we see, um, you know, when Jesus spoke to them about the fact that it was very difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom, notice that the Bible didn't say that it's impossible, right? But it's, it's challenging because of the mindset that comes with the wealth. Um, and so the... the the question was asked, who then can be saved? Um, and Peter began to talk to Jesus um, and express that they had given up all to follow him. And that Jesus began to talk to them about the reward that they're going to receive. That, you know, if you've done that, he's going to um, return to you a hundredfold. And we ended with the, the um, Jesus expressing the reward that he was going to give them, and among that reward, of the rewards um, noted um, in Mark chapter 10, I think it's verse um, 30 or, or 29, was that they would receive persecution, which I, when I thought about that, I was like, wow, Jesus is listing all the rewards that they're going to get from, you know, giving up everything to follow him, and he's mentioned persecution. And I, as I was thinking about that, you know, if you endure persecution with the right mindset, you're going to come out better. You will come out better. If you actually, um, you know, learn what God is trying to, to teach you, like, you will come out better and stronger. No, if you, if you go through it, you know, jogging, <laughs> walk, holding one leg and questioning God, uh, maybe not. But this is not really meant to hurt you or harm you. Right? Amen. And so um, I, I mentioned that this morning as we, we, we continue in Mark chapter 10, and we're um, really still in the, the, the section where they're on their way towards Jerusalem. And so Mark chapter 10 and verse 32, Jesus again predicted his death. This is the third time. The Bible says, and when they were in the way going to Jerusalem, so they were heading to Jerusalem, Jesus went ahead of them. And the Bible says that they were amazed. Why were they amazed? They were afraid. Why were they afraid? If you think about what we just spoke about, Jesus talking to them about how blessed they are going to be. A hundredfold. I probably would be amazed if somebody tell me, hey, Greg, you know what? For sure you're going to receive a million dollars tomorrow. Man, I, I, I'd be amazed, right? Um, because they had seen Jesus done so many miracles and predicted stuff, and it happened. So, right, they're like, wow. But they were also afraid. Why were they afraid? There was a lot of uncertainty about the future because Jesus told them, like, you know what? I'm going to die. I'm going to raise again the third day. We, we, the, remember I said this is the third time. So the first time when he talked to them about this, one, Peter, rebuked him and said, no, nah, this is not going to happen. And Jesus talked to him about not savoring the things of God, not mindful. Not his, his mind was not on godly thoughts. He was thinking about it from a humanistic point of view, really thinking about Jesus setting up an earthly kingdom. So um, Jesus, Jesus said, you know, get behind me, Satan. Not that Peter was Satan, but the thought, what he was thinking about was not of God. So if it's not of God, we mentioned this before, there is no position of neutrality with God. You're either for him or against him. 
right? So there is no position of neutrality. And so that's what happened the first time. The second occasion, the Bible says that they did not understand what Jesus was saying. And they didn't choose to ask him, Lord, explain what you mean by this. No, on this third occasion, so Jesus, chapter 8, chapter 9, and now in chapter 10, Jesus is repeating this, 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 this prediction or telling them what is going to happen in the future. And having the mindset or the thought that Jesus was going to set up an earth in the kingdom, and now Jesus is telling them that he's going to die, I would be afraid. I'll tell you this. Uh, I've mentioned this before. For the past six months, my company has been in a, what we call Chapter 11, uh, reorganizing, uh, trying to get out of some problem, financial problem that they put themselves in, the leaders put us in. And there are many people that were afraid to the point that they left because for them, they don't see the future. There's a lot of uncertainty. So they were afraid. You know, I am concerned but not afraid because I know the God that I serve. And he has done it before, so I, right? And so God is able. So I'm not afraid, I'm concerned. But generally, people are afraid when there's a lot of uncertainty. And so the disciples here were afraid. Now, Jesus tried to help them, right? So Jesus now took the disciples and began to talk to them. And on this occasion, he provide more graphic detail as to kind of what's going to happen. He said, saying, behold, we go to Jerusalem. We're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests. So in other words, some, one of you guys are going to betray me. Deliver me into the hand of the chief priests and unto the scribes. And then they're going to condemn me to death. Now, Jesus had told them all about this previously. And he specifically mentioned that shall deliver him to the Gentiles. This wasn't stated previously. So Jesus was telling them, like, you know what? They're going to deliver me into the hand of the Romans. And they shall mock me. They shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. It says, on the third day, he shall rise again. It's almost like they had selective hearing because all they heard was about the death. The whole resurrection piece kind of just went through one ear and through the other, right? They just didn't understand <laughs> what was going to happen. So they, they had selective hearing here. Um, one thing we, we, we understand is that at this point, um, you know, Israel was an occupied territory. So, um, you know, they weren't allowed to um, conduct capital punishment. They had to submit to the Roman authority. The Rome, Romans could do it, but they couldn't, right? And so um, they could punish lesser crime, but they, the Romans are the one who execute an offender. And we understand that these Romans they showed great contempt for their prisoners. They mocked them, they beat them before killing them. But Jesus, like I said, mentioned that despite all of these things, that he's going to rise again. And as I mentioned before, they had selective hearing. I, um, as I was thinking about this, one of the thoughts that went through my mind is, and, and this should be clear to all of us, that the prediction of Jesus' death and resurrection really showed that these events were a part of God's plan. This was not an accident. This wasn't just happenstance, but this was God's design and showed that he was in control. Amen? So picture this, right? Jesus is trying to get through to the disciples about what is going to transpire, what was coming, um, you know, merely weeks away. And they just was not getting it. How do you know that, Brother Gary? Well, if you kind of go back a little bit, you see some of the things that they were dealing with. Despite Jesus telling them about his death, they were concerned about who is going to be the greatest. The next scenario, what we see is James and John 
two brothers requesting a position of authority. How does that line up with the kingdom? There's a disconnect here between what Jesus is trying to convey to them and where their mind was at. And I, I mentioned this, you know, I, I, God just dropped this in my, in my mind this morning. The Bible says that we should walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the loss of the flesh. I think I spoke to, um, maybe not to everybody about this, but about how the brain works. And if you continuously respond or act a certain way, that's going to be your go-to. Right? So by walking in the Spirit, if you do the things that the Bible says you're to do, the more you do them, the more you're going to respond in that manner. If you're somebody who likes to lie, that's going to be your first response. But if you're somebody who try to tell the truth and you practice that, the more you do it, the more that's going to become the norm, so to speak. And I say this this morning because clearly the disciples' minds were not centered around the kingdom as God would want them to do. They were thinking more about the earthly kingdom. And so we understand that Jesus devoted quite a bit of um, his final time on earth to talk to the disciples about his death and his resurrection and also try to prepare them for the time when he would no longer be with them physically. And so on this occasion, James and John came and made a special request of Jesus. The Bible says, and James and John, the son of Zebedee, came unto him saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do to us whatsoever ye shall desire. Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. That's kind of what they were saying. It's kind of like uh, someone going to a police officer and uh, tell them that they commit a crime. But prior to that, they're like, I'm going to tell you about a crime that I did, but promise me you're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> Thing doesn't happen that way, right? Right? Or, you know, if somebody asks me to, to do something, promise me you're going to do that. I'm like, it depends. I'm not going to commit myself to a promise until I know what exactly you're, you're asking me. But this is what the disciples were doing. Like, hey, Jesus, let's do a pinky swear. That's really what it was. Um, one thing that I found interesting here is that if you go back to the book of Matthew, it actually says that their mother um, request, made the request. And many people have pointed to this as a contradiction. I, I honestly don't see a contradiction because what was very clear was that mother and sons were in agreement in wanting a position of authority. In fact, as I thought about it, and if you look at the disciples' response, you know, you could see why maybe James and John wouldn't want to act themselves, right? Because it was going to create some issues. So, but what was very clear is that they were together, right? Um, and if you even look at the response, the, the responses both in Matthew and Mark were pretty much the same for James and John. So, you know, this is Greg, personal intuition was that they were trying to kind of save face a little bit. Mom, why, why don't you ask? But the request really was coming from them. It was really their desire to be, uh, to, 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 to get a place of honor. And he said unto them, what, what do you want me to do? And they said, grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other and the left hand in thy glory. Interesting request here. They certainly understand that Jesus, what Jesus was saying, or, or, or let me express it differently. They did not understand what Jesus was, was, was saying about his death, his resurrection, and the kingdom of God. And so they were jostling for position. They were in jostling for position of greatness. But Jesus defined greatness very different than the world. 
Greatness in the eyes of Jesus is expressed in the form of service. We understand that James and John, along with Peter, they, um, you could say they were the inner circle of the disciples, right? Um, and they came to Jesus and requested a specific thing from him. They said, Master, we would that thou sh shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire, as I mentioned before. And, and we talk about the fact that there's really no contradiction in, 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 in um, what is described in the book of Matthew and the book of Mark. Jesus didn't give in to their request. And I think that is important because if you read the book of Proverbs 15 and verse 29, it says, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. The Bible did not say that he answers all the prayers of the righteous. He hears. We need to get that through our, our head. You know, the, the disciples at this point, right, along with many of the Jews, they had the wrong idea of the Messiah's kingdom. They thought he was going to establish an earthly kingdom that would free Israel from Rome's oppression. But as they begin to follow Jesus towards Jerusalem, they realized that something was going to happen. They could sense a change. And they hoped that Jesus would be inaugurating his kingdom. And so it's not surprising that James and John wanted a position of honor in God's kingdom. In fact, if you uh, were to study a little bit about, you know, some of the ancient royal court, the person that was chosen to be on the left and the right typically were the most powerful people in the kingdom next to the king. So you, you understand what they were asking for. I want to be one of the top dogs, so to speak, in the kingdom, Jesus. Next to you, I, I, I want to be the most powerful person. So they certainly understand that Jesus would have a kingdom. It just wasn't clear to them what that kingdom looks like, what it meant. They did not understand that Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. That it, it's not centered in places, in palaces and thrones, but in the hearts and lives of his followers. None of this, the disciples understood this truth until after Jesus' resurrection. And here now is what Jesus responded to the disciples. He said, you don't know what you're asking me. You really don't understand what the request that you're asking me. He says, can you drink of the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Jesus was saying, hey, you know what? You guys have a self-centered request. But you really don't know what you're asking for. To request a position of highest honor meant requesting suffering. Because you just can't have one without the other. In, God, in my kingdom, this is what it means. The cup that Jesus was referring to here was the suffering that he would have to endure in order to accomplish salvation for sinners. The baptism could be equated to being overwhelmed by suffering. Jesus, in essence, was asking James and John if they were ready to suffer for the sake of the kingdom. That's really what he was asking. And notice their response. They were like, yeah. And you could, you could probably convince yourself that they were filled with pride or bravado in their response, but that was not the case. They really loved Jesus to the extent that they wanted to follow him, right? So they're like, God, we'll, we'll do whatever. Jesus indicated to them, well, you know what? You're going to experience it. And, you know, if we read the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12 and verse 2, we understand that James died as a Martha. And John lived for many years 
Many years of persecution before he was forced to the Isle of Patmos. You can find this in Revelation 1 verse 9. As I was thinking about this, you know, I, I've certainly said, Lord, you know, I, I'm not going to let anything here prevent me from following you. Because that's the most important thing for me is to live and reign with you. I'm not going to let anything in this world hinder me. But at the same time, and I, I'm, I'm putting myself in the picture, like we say that, but at times we're unwilling to suffer minor irritations. Because, you know, the thing is, like, if you're going to serve people, it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. Whether you're in the church or outside of the church, it's going to happen. Of absolutely, offenses will come. So if you're going to serve Jesus, rather than getting upset, grow. Just grow. I can tell you if, um, if I took offense to what everyone said of me, both in the church, I've had people lie on me. And you know what I did? I said, and, and, and came back to me, I said, Okay, if that's what you feel happened, okay. But here's, here's the real deal. It's up to you to, to take it, whatever, but I don't have time for this. I don't have time to dwell on things that are really not going to help me grow. If it's not going to help me grow, why bother? One of the things that we are doing as a company right now is to really look at some of the things that we have done in the past that has caused problems. And, you know, initially it was like, well, we want to focus on the things that are going to have big changes, big results. And I said, you know, excuse me, but, you know, there are some little things that we should be doing. And if you add them up, they'll turn into a... I am saying this this morning because... Too often, as people, we, we get offended for somebody look at, look at us the wrong way. Somebody said, hey, Brother Keith, you know, you sang that song and it wasn't right on key. Or uh, who, are you do, who are you singing to? Are you singing for or are you praising God? One other thing that has allowed me to excel both in God, and uh, you can argue whether or not I excel, but let's say I c I've continued to serve in God, as well as on the job, is that I always keep my mind on the goal. I always, because it's easy. It's easy to veer to the left. It's easy to veer to the right. But if you know where you're going, if you know what you're trying to accomplish, then certain things you're going to realize, <laughs> hey, I'm not even going to let that, let me just brush that off. I'm just going to shake that off. So, yeah, the Bible says we should what? Lay aside the weight that so easily beset us. Well, when, you're, when you're running a race, and you, you don't want to have all of these baggage and all of these stuff because it's going to slow you down. You want, if you don't want to be slowed down, get rid of it. Get rid of the mindset that is going to cause you to, 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 to get upset and... I, I never understood this. Well, I do because I was in that position at one point where I was willing to allow what somebody say or do allow me to leave God. But when I really and truly pray through, that no longer matters. That no longer matters to me. I'm like, I'm serving God. I, I, I'm serving God. I don't care what. So if you're, mo that's why it's a very important church that we read and study the word of God. Says thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. The word of God is important for direction, for instruction, and we need it. We need it. We need it. And that wasn't something I was planning on talking about, but I felt instructed to do that. I really like the way that, or I shouldn't say I like it, but I, I look at the response that Jesus gave to the disciples about their request. He said, you know what? 
it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And I thought that was very interesting. This revealed that God is omniscient. He already know what was going to happen and who is going to be in that place of position of honor. One thing that also stood out to me was the fact that Jesus didn't ridicule James and John for their request. He denied their request, but he did not ridicule them. We can ask God for whatever we want, but it may be denied. Now it's up to you to, as to what you're going to do about it, right? You can take it with the attitude that God don't, didn't hear me. The Bible says that he hears, right? So that's false. Denied. I don't know. Uh, when I was uh, applying to uh, for a visa to come to the U.S., um, I was kind of crazy in what I did because um, they were actually sending me. The college was sending me to a conference, and I had letters and everything. And I decided to um, not show it to the person that was doing the interview. And so they were pretty much to the point where they were going to stamp and say denied. Because um, I saw that happening to the others, and then I, um, I just kind of wanted to see how they're gonna interview me without this letter from. And so I showed them the letter, and they were like, "Why didn't you show this to us before?" I'm like, and so that denied train to okay, well, you'll get a visa, but you know you you, you, you see where denied. That's what God does with some of your your your, your requests because it's not godly. God knows what's best for us. He wants to give us what's best for us, not merely what we want. And so he denies some of our requests for our own good. And I'm glad that he does that. As parents, there are times kids ask for stuff, right? But as a parent with experience, with foresight, with insight, because you've been through this. Like, no, we're, we're not going to do that. Here's what we're going to do. And so God knows the beginning from the end. And there are just some requests that God says, no, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Just forget about it. And that's okay. Don't get offended because God says, no. Yeah. Jesus really ends this really um, interaction with some very important information to the disciples. And I'm going to read it. So, but Jesus came, called them. In, in fact, let, let me back up a little bit. Because one of the things that transpired here was that when the other disciples heard what they had asked. They were upset, man. They were displeased. It's almost like there was this type of jealousy or they wanted a position of honor themselves. But guess what? This, the kingdom of God wasn't about that. And Jesus decided to address it. He, so he called them together and he said, you know that they which are Accounted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. And I'll explain this to you in a minute. But so shall not it be among you. My kingdom is very different than what you're, 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 you've experienced. Whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister or servant. And whosoever for you will be the chief fish, shall be servant. Mm. So Jesus began to explain to them the difference between the kingdom of the world, the earthly kingdom, and God's kingdom, which they had not yet experienced. The kingdom of the world, for example, the Roman Empire, have tyrants, high official, 
who lord it over other people, exercising their authority and demanding submission. The kingdom of God, which you could say had already begun with the, the 12 disciples, was not set up for someone to lord it over others. Instead, the Bible says that the greatest person would be the servant of all. A real leader has a servant heart. Willingly helping others as needed. Servant leaders appreciate others. They appreciate others' worth. And realize that they are not above any job. They are not jealous about someone else's gift. But gladly fulfill their own duty. Jesus was very clear here. And left no room for misunderstanding or misinterpretation that his disciples should serve sacrificially. He told them that true greatness comes in serving others. And this is the attitude, church, that we need to, 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 to take on as we carry out the mission of sharing the gospel across the world. This is the type of attitude that we need to take on where we're not pointing and putting down others, amen, but we're trying to build up and help others. It's, it's, it's very easy at times. And, and, and to be honest, because I've done it, so I'm not trying to point a finger at anybody. Honestly, when we're, when we're pointing out stuff and, and approaching things that way, we're not right with God. We're not reading and, and, and studying the word of God. Because that's not what God asks us or requires of us. Jesus himself was a perfect example of a servant leader. He said, I, I came not to serve, to be served, but to serve others. And the Bible says that he gives his life as a ransom for many. What's a ransom? It's a price that is paid to release a slave from bondage. He paid a ransom for us. The demand price was his life. He took our place and he died the debt we deserve. So in the middle of Jesus talking to the disciples about what is to come, we see this you could say it's a common theme of the disciples not understanding and focusing sometimes on, on the wrong thing. You know, we, we have the word of God that we need to, to um, meditate on so that we can be in tune with what God is trying to accomplish, both in our midst, in our community, on the job. We, we have to do that. I am just amazed as to how many things the Bible covers. I'm just amazed. I am extremely amazed. And I, and I tell you something. If we, the more we take on, the better our relationship at this level will be, the better our relationship with God will be, and that is if you really study the word of God with an intent to be better, with the right mindset, right? If you're reading it to try to find contradiction, then no. But if you're reading it and say, Lord, can you reveal to me your truth? God, help me understand God. God, I want to be more and more like you, God. Let your words come alive in my life. Amen. Then God will, God will reveal this truth to you. Amen. We're going to end with this uh, story this morning, amen, of Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus. And I, I think this conveys the, or, or how should I put this? Jesus actually gave a perfect example as to how, how you can serve others. Let, let's just put it that way. So 
the healing of Bartimaeus, and, and we know, if we, we, we talked about this before, Bar, Bar Timaeus, the son, Bar, means son of Timaeus. So his father's name was Timaeus. Okay? So this was Bar Timaeus. This healing actually took place, or, or was, it, was one of the final events that happened before the Passion Week. And throughout Jesus' um, interaction with various people, there have been many instances where the crowd essentially misconstrued um, Jesus' intention. And this was one of them. And I'll explain this a little bit. His disciples arrived in the city of Jericho. We understand that the old Jericho was destroyed um, by the Israelites. You can find that in Joshua 6 and verse 20. But Herod the Great, during his reign over Palestine, rebuilt the, the city of Jericho. It was about a mile from the original city. It was close to the River Jordan and around 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So I say this because I understand that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So it was about 18 miles out of Jerusalem at this point. And a large crowd was following behind Jesus, along with his disciples. And they came upon a, a blind beggar sitting by the roadside. Beggars, as you would imagine, would often wait along the road near the city because this is where they could get the most people, right? C come in contact with the most people. And so Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was on his way maybe because of the, the noise in the crowd or, or whatever. He knows that something was happening. Somebody was coming. Maybe somebody told him that it was Jesus. One thing that I found very interesting here was the fact that Bartimaeus called Jesus the son of David. I, I could surmise that as a Jew, this is something that they would have studied and learned about the Messiah, that he would be a descendant of King David. They thought David was probably one of the greatest king of Israel, and the expectation was that the Messiah, that he would come in the line of David or as a descendant of David. They believed that he was going to bring back the glory days of King David, so, and he would reign over Israel, and they would have their own empire once again. There are many verses in the, in the, in the Old Testament um, describing or mentioning Jesus as a son of David. And you may say, well, how is it that Jesus is a son of David if David lived over a thousand years before Jesus? The answer is that Christ was a fulfillment of prophecy. He was the promised Messiah, which means he had to be of the lineage of David. And if you study the book of Matthew, and Brother Jeff actually went through this, we understand that Jesus was a descendant of um, David, Abraham, through Joseph. If you look at this through, in the book of Luke chapter 3, he was also in the lineage of David through his mother. Double whammy here, right? But it is interesting to me that though this man was blind in the flesh, there was something going, a little bit going on spiritually. Maybe he didn't have a full grasp. Maybe he, based on the education that was, he was given about Jesus, based on what he heard about the miracles that Jesus was doing, he probably made a connection. I thought it would, was, was um, very, very, very useful to kind of point out a few scriptures here that pointed to Jesus uh, or made a connection with Jesus as a descendant of David. My apologies, I probably have too much scripture here. But we are very familiar with the book of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be up on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, mighty God, or the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. It's going to happen. Here's another one. This is in Jeremiah. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. A king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is a name whereby he shall be called the Lord of righteousness. And just to end it out, just to show you about the miraculous um, healings and stuff that were prophesied, Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as on heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and the streams in the desert. With this knowledge, you could see how that connection could be made. Hurry. The blind man could see that possibly Jesus was a long awaited Messiah, while so many who actually witnessed Jesus' miracles were blind to his identity. Refusing to open their eyes to the truth, seeing with one eye doesn't guarantee seeing with the heart. What, what do I mean by that? Having physical sight doesn't necessarily mean that your heart. Is at the right place. Although Jesus was preoccupied with what was up, the upcoming event, meaning his death and resurrection, he demonstrated what he had just told the, the, the disciples about serving by stopping to care for this blind man. Blindness, we understood, was considered as a curse from God by some. You can find it in John chapter 9 and verse 2. But Jesus refuted this idea when he took when he told the people to call the man to him. I want to say something here this morning because Bartholomew has heard that Jesus was coming, right? And um, the people, he, he, he started calling out, cry out, Jesus, oh, son of Der David, have mercy on me. And they told him to stop. And, you know, and this is correct. We have always talked about people, you know, trying to, stop us from getting what we receive. But if you think about it, it wouldn't be uncommon for people to say, you know, if you have somebody who's important and people are crowding them or begging to say, come on, man, like, you know, let's create some space here. This is not, this is not necessary right now, right? So, you know, maybe it wasn't meant to be intentional is what I'm saying. They were just doing what was normal to say, hey, you know, Leave our, leave our leader alone, right? Let him go peacefully. And I say that this morning because people can and will do things that is just life. You're trying to get somewhere in God and somebody just does something. I, I don't know why I keep on going back to this offense thing. Maybe just, that's just who they are. That's just how they conduct themselves. Don't let that stop you from getting to where you need to get at in God. It's about a relationship between you and God. Don't let anything prevent you from getting your healing, from getting your breakthrough. The thing that struck me a little bit was the fact that he wanted something, and he wasn't, he wasn't going to let anyone stop him, regardless as to whether or not they were doing it intentionally and trying to push him back, or it was just trying to protect their master. He was like, this is my time, this is my day. You know, Jesus, you know, indicated that they should bring him to him, and it is interesting because he was in a state as a beggar. The first thing he did was to cast off his coat. 
if you're going to receive what you need to receive from Jesus, you're going to have to lay aside certain things. There are certain things that you're going to have to, I can't go to Jesus like this. I'm not going to get what I need like this if I just go in the same state, the same position. If I come to him without faith, I'm not going to receive what I need. So those doubts, I need, I, need I need to lay them aside. I, I need to just, the mindset that I have that Jesus doesn't care about me and I'm different and I'm just a lowly. No, we're a child of the king. Amen. So come to Jesus expecting, expecting the unexpected. I, I'm just, my mindset is like, God, like you said it, I believe it. I'm going to ask for it. I'm going to make sure it line up with your word. If you say no, I'm okay. But that's not going to stop me from asking. I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe. If you said it, I'm going to believe. Why should I doubt? There are many that believe that this blind man, um, that he wasn't blind from birth. Um, the reason why that is said is um, the word that is used um, in the scripture here. I'm trying to. Jesus asked him, what will you do unto me? And the man said that unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. The word that is um, used in the original language, and pardon me here with my pronunciation. I didn't study Greek or Hebrew. It's anab, anablepo. Anablepo. Means to recover sight. So likely he, at some point he could see. And so literally he is saying like, God, I, I want to recover my sight. His faith, his persistence in not allowing anything to stop him from getting to Jesus or crying out to Jesus resulted in him receiving his sight. He understood Jesus' lordship. But the boldness of his faith was really the important thing here. He acted upon what he had heard about Jesus. He asked for mercy, but received sight. I'm going to end here this morning. It's the um, important thing is don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. But it's important that we read the word of God and make sure that our request to God is godly. And if Jesus says no, it's okay. He knows best. Jesus wants to bless us. Amen? Amen. He says, I want you to prosper even as your soul prosper. That tells me that your soul is of much more important. We should be doing more to ensure that our soul is prospering. We're going to end here this morning. Amen. Next week we'll pick up on the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. I encourage you to read ahead. Amen. Um, the word of God. It's, it's good. Amen. I, I don't know if this is good for you, but I know it's good for me just studying the word of God and meditating on the word of God. It's, it's, it's awesome. Amen. Amen. Let us uh, pray this morning. God, we're so thankful, Lord, for your word this morning, Lord. God, help us, Lord, to continue to meditate on your word, to apply, God, to, to grow, God, and be, become closer to you, God. God, bless the food this morning, God, that uh, we're going to partake of, God. And as we come back, Lord, um, let our mind and our heart be focused on you, God. And as we come back to a time of celebration, move in our midst. Bless us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.